Hello and welcome to The Conversation Weekly. In this episode, we are looking back at 50 years of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy, a site of Indigenous protest in Canberra, Australia. We hear about its history and about the impact the protest site has had on the next generation of Indigenous activists. Those four men sat down on the lawns outside of Parliament House and erected a beach umbrella and held a sign that said Aboriginal Embassy. Those children will look around them and say, hmm, not much has changed. This place needs to stand and maybe it needs to grow. And later in the show, new research into how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting the lives of young people around the world and their job prospects. For young people, it's been less about the health effects of the crisis and it's been much more about uh, the economic effects of the lockdowns and the drop in economic activity. I'm Dan Reno in San Francisco. And I'm Gemma Ware in London. And this week we're joined by our colleague Carissa Lee, the Conversations Commissioning Editor for Indigenous Public Policy based in Melbourne, Australia. Welcome, Carissa. Great to be here. And it's great to have you on the show. You're listening to The Conversation Weekly, The World Explained by Experts. So, Carissa, where should we start this story? Well, you've got to understand yarning. And what is yarning? Well, yarning is a conversational practice that First Nations people do. Uh, It's also known as talking circles in Native America, uh, Pacific Folks call it Talanoa. It's the act of deep listening. It's like a methodology for Indigenous people that we sit and talk and a really wonderful way to get to know people, actually. And so you've been doing quite a lot of yarning yourself, have you? Yeah, I am. Um, well, you know, I've done it and not really realised that that was what was going on. <laughs> it's kind of a cultural practice that you sort of take for granted. But I did a lot of it during my thesis. And as a, a Noongar woman born on Wemba Wemba country, it's something that I've been finding really, really important as part of the way I communicate with mob. Uh, Mob is a term that we use to refer to First Nations people. And we're really lucky because you've been having a couple of yarns for our podcast. Uh, Yes, I've been yarning with Linda Junko and Bronwyn Carlson, both uh, First Nations researchers out of Macquarie University. We've been having a big old yarn about marking the 50th anniversary of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy in Canberra. And what the tent embassy is as a site of Indigenous protest. And before we get into hearing that, um, we should say that this story is supported by the UK-Australia Season Patrons Board, the British Council and the Australian Government as part of its UK-Australia Season, which reflects on the two countries' shared history, explores their current relationship and imagines their future together. And we should say too that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are advised that this story contains names of deceased people and themes that might be distressing to First Nations people. Do you remember the first time you ever went to the tent embassy? You know, I I do. It goes right back to when I was um, about seven years old. This is Linda Junko. I'm a proud Radjuri and Bardo Island woman from Arambi, Cara, New South Wales in Australia. I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. I'm a teacher, cultural educator and Indigenous rights activist. Um, I'm actually joining in here from uh, the Darug Nation of Western Sydney. I'm about to embark on my PhD journey at Macquarie University, which will explore Wiradjuri custodianship and cultural resurgence in the 21st century as a form of resistance against settler colonialism. Linda June's first visit to the Aboriginal Tent Embassy in Canberra was in 1988. I can remember my aunties and uncles standing up having very fiery, very robust conversations with, with other First Nations people around the fire. And there was always this strategy around what our next move is in in terms of what was going on behind the scenes with policy, with laws that were just being drafted up in Parliament. I wasn't aware of it at the time, but when I look back at it, it was always strategy that these mob were talking about. And very militant as well. Lots of um, swearing as well (laughs) from what I can remember. Man, there's a lot to swear about though. (laughs) Oh, hell yes, hell yes. So, you know, there was a lot of anger, a lot of rage, but also a lot of love, which I could only explain for um, in in terms of justice that our mob had been fighting for for over 200 years. Yeah. 
The history of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy begins 50 years ago, on the 26th of January 1972. The exact date is important. The 26th of January is a day that has two names here in Australia. Many Australians know it as Australia Day, a public holiday to mark the day in 1788 when the first fleet of British ships landed at Sydney Cove. But for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, it's called Invasion Day or Survival Day, the day when the invasion of our country began. In January 1972, Australia was led by the government of Prime Minister William McMahon from the Liberal Party. Around this time, demands had been growing for Aboriginal land rights, in particular in Australia's Northern Territory. On the 25th of January, the eve of Invasion Day, McMahon made a speech that effectively dismissed hopes for Aboriginal land rights. Instead, his government proposed a scheme in which First Nations groups could apply for leases over reserved land in the Northern Territory. But these proposed leases left out mineral and forestry rights. So on the morning of the 26th of January 1972, four young Aboriginal men left Sydney on a journey to protest against the McMahon government's statement that Aboriginal land rights was, was going to be denied and that he was going to continue on with an assimilative agenda that our people have been relegated to for over 100 years. Those four men, Tony Curry, Bertie Williams, Billy Craigie and Michael Anderson, sat down on the lawns outside of Parliament House and erected a beach umbrella and held a sign that said Aboriginal Embassy. What they essentially did was commence the oldest political protest site in the world, which called for the recognition of Aboriginal sovereignty, self-determination and land rights in this country that is so-called Australia. In early February, about a week after erecting the umbrella, the members of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy issued a list of demands to the government. They demanded rights as Aboriginal people to our homelands, compensation where the land was not able to be returned, and protection of our sacred sites. The protesters were met by resistance from the Australian authorities. I asked Linda how the First Nations people worked around that. What they actually found was a loophole in the law around protesting or camping on Parliament lawns. So... They actually stayed on site right up until February and it wasn't until then that uh, police came along and had a standoff with the young people there. I've watched many videos of them linking arms as the tents were torn down and they're chanting for Aboriginal land rights, um, only to re-emerge later on and re-establish themselves. Linda June's family were involved in the tent embassy from the very start. Bertie Williams and Billy Craigie, two of the four men who travelled down from Redfern, a suburb of Sydney, in January 1972 for her relatives. My mob, well, my father's siblings actually, were involved in the, the 72 protest. Uncle Paul and Annie Isabel Co. travelled down to Canberra from Sydney not too long after uh, the 26th of January and stayed on for this protest camp. Um, at the time, my uncle Paul was a lawyer, a young, fiery lawyer, um, involved in the Black Caucus and the Black Power Movement in Redfern. And um, that's essentially how my mob got involved, through being involved in that early black consciousness which emerged out of the 1960s, 70s, and which were you know, globally influenced by the black and indigenous Uh, movement that were happening around the world and in particular the United States. That's really cool and your family is still very much involved with the Tent Embassy now, hey? Yeah, yeah. Um, We've now got the next generation taking up the space down there at the Embassy as fire keepers, as educators and as um, organisers as well. So Annie Isabel's eldest daughters, Diana and Naika Ko, have been very much uh, involved over the last few years as well as Annie Jenny, my dad's other sister, is still very much a presence there on camp, which I believe has actually joined in with this yarn too. My mothers, they had country out here at Rye Park. They were farmed land there for three generations. My mother's family, the Wedges, uh, that's our connection here. She was born out at uh, Blakeney Creek, so that's not far. This is Linda June's Auntie Jenny. Jenny Monroe, maiden name Coe, 
My colleague, Ellen Duffy, who's based in Canberra, went down to meet her at the Aboriginal Tent Embassy. This is just a part of the parliamentary square, the parliamentary triangle, I suppose they call it now, but it used to be a square. Um, we're opposite old Parliament House. The Embassy's been here since um, the 26th of January 1972. It's been basically set up to enable Aboriginal people to talk to the federal government basically about political issues as and when they arise. Auntie Jenny first started coming to the Tent Embassy in 1972. It was eye-opening, she says, being there right at the beginning of the protest. Inspiring, I think, to hear some of the um, rhetoric and the oratory of the leaders, young leaders that were down here at the time. Um, my brother Paul Co, um, John Newfong, Bruce McGuinness, a lot of our people that had been articulating the positions of our people prior to the embassy who came together. I think the embassy in 72 stood for about 11 months. It went, went up in January and came down in November of 72 when Whitlam was elected. Gough Whitlam had been the leader of Australia's opposition Labor Party when the Tent Embassy was erected. While the McMahon government had little interest in negotiating with the protesters, Whitlam visited the embassy and publicly promised legislation for Aboriginal land rights under a future Labor government. He'd actually came over and spoke to the people that were here camped and made some commitments in relation to legislative changes if he was voted in, which he, he certainly tried to do during his time as Prime Minister. Australia passed a Racial Discrimination Act in 1975. That same year, Whitlam handed back lands to the Gurdjie people of the Northern Territory. In a moment captured in a now famous photo, Whitlam poured a fistful of dirt through the hands of Vincent Lingyari, a prominent Aboriginal rights activist. Then came the Aboriginal Land Rights Act of 1976, which allowed Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory to claim rights to land based on traditional occupation. It paved the way for similar land rights legislation across the country. All of these legislations that were enacted basically talked rhetoric about justice but didn't deliver any justice. Um, lands were given back. We had very little land given back to us in New South Wales. I think there's missions in Queensland that are bigger than the whole amount of land that we received in New South Wales in 83. So it was very little land. The existing reserves we'd already occupied basically. and any other crown land that we could claim and make good on the claim. So not, not a lot of land available through the New South Wales land rights legislation. When the protest camp ended in November 1972, the tent embassy didn't go away. In the years that followed, it occupied several other sites around Canberra. Then in 1988, the Australian seat of parliament moved from old parliament house to a new site nearby. A few years later, in 1992, the Tent Embassy returned to its original site on the lawn of Old Parliament House to mark the 20th anniversary of the original protest. A permanent structure was erected, but in 2003, much of the embassy was destroyed by fire in a suspected case of arson. Soon after, the police attempted to remove protesters from the site under orders from the federal government. They didn't succeed and the embassy endured. In 2015, it was added to Australia's Commonwealth Heritage List, marking places of Indigenous historic and cultural value. Over the past 50 years, the Tent Embassy has stood as a symbol of Indigenous sovereignty and the fight for land rights. I had another yarn with somebody else who knows a lot about that fight. Bronwyn Carlson. I'm a professor and head of department of Indigenous Studies at Macquarie University. I'm also a Nukana person and my family originate from South Australia a few generations ago, but I was born here and raised here on the beautiful lands of the Dharawal people in Wollongong. And I think it's important to also acknowledge that I work at Macquarie University, which is on the lands of the Wallamatical people of the Darug Nation, who every day I get the pleasure of working with and for. What are the demands for justice and sovereignty behind the protest? So if we think about the movement as being about land and land rights and return, that in itself has so many layers, right? Land rights is about sovereignty. So that's about dismantling the unlawful system that has overlaid our rights as first people here. And so that is Australian, right? That's Australia. That's the unlawful space. 
and even in Australian courts, we know that um, the unlawful theft of these lands has been overturned as being false and unlawful, yet it still stands. So it's more than just um, about land rights. And so then if we think about our relationship to land, what does that entail? Well, homelessness, as it's framed, is a huge issue for Indigenous people. Now, we know that homelessness comes with ill health, comes with dangers, right? It comes with mental health issues. Now, we also know that Indigenous people suffer intergenerational trauma due to past policies and the continuing practices of the colonial government that we see. So we see lots of children being removed continually in this contemporary time. We see the deaths of Indigenous people constantly. So all of these things are interrelated. Mm. So if you come in and invade somebody's land and overlay it with your own system, then every aspect of that person's thinking and life and relationships is damaged. And that's what needs addressing. So the whole thing is about land rights for sure, but land rights is huge. And even if you think about that in terms of Western thinking, right, you know, the means of production, etc. Land is essential to one having the ability to provide for themselves. Always has been. For us, it's even deeper than that. It's about a healthy relationship with place. Like koalas now are on the endangered list. How have settlers oh, managed that yeah. in contemporary Australia? It's so messed up. It's so yeah. messed up. So whilst the tent embassy is primarily the symbol of land rights, it means so much more. It's actually a symbol against the power that's unlawfully in place across this continent that continues to oppress Indigenous people and deny us our rights as sovereign peoples to this place. Absolutely. Because, yeah, land is just a starting point. As we yarned, Bronwyn told me where the tent embassy fits within a long history of Indigenous activism. The tent embassy was erected from a whole range of activities that took place, right going back to the 30s um, and even before. So we could track that to early colonial frontier wars where Indigenous people said, nah, this is our land, you're not taking it, and fought massive fight um, to a great extent, causing fear and havoc amongst settlers. And then we saw the sort of political activism start taking place in the 20s and 30s, where Indigenous people began to come together. And under the really oppressive conditions. And then so right from the 30s through to the 60s, we saw the rise of, you know, the Black Power movement. I think it would have been just a fantastic time to be around there with these Black Panthers yeah, in the city. Sure. Yeah, you can just imagine. I've seen some photos, you know, they're very cool, um, meeting around kitchen tables, saying F off to the yeah. police. Because <laughs> Indigenous people in this country were still under those oppressive regimes and probably arguably still are. So you've got these youngsters now saying, nah, we're not putting up with that. We've seen our old people suffer and fight over and over. And so we're being really radical and they've been hugely informed by the world. Like I said, always interested in global politics. And, and so the 60s and 70s, really changed the landscape because, you know, now you've got TV, you've got radio, you've got access to media. So the Tent Embassy was a result of that early activism and it's set up and it's so physical, you know, it's not just a hashtag, a movement. It is this physical space that occupies a prominent place in this, you know, settler nation's capital, a place that they hold great value in, the place where their dignitaries arrive, the place where we can say, nah, not moving. And if we think back, every sort of decade, there's always some controversy, right? When the Tent Embassy marked its 40th anniversary in 2012, that controversy was sparked by Tony Abbott, then leader of the opposition Liberal Party. On the 40th anniversary, he makes these comments that, uh, isn't it time that we moved on? What does it still stand for? I can understand why the Tent Embassy was established all those years ago. Uh, I think a lot has changed for the better since then and I think it probably is time to move on from that. At the time I thought what are you talking about? I don't recall sovereignty being returned to uh, Indigenous people. <laughs> I don't believe the government structure or settler colonial structures here were dismantled in any way. I don't remember that memo. So just nonsense and of course we saw Blackfellas turn out on force to protest against that kind of nonsense. And that's the really interesting thing for um, Indigenous people connected to the tent embassy is they're not going to let the government have that kind of nonsense or discriminate against the people who keep the fires burning there in any way. And that's why they're not going to let this silly white supremacist group take hold either. 
These white supremacists Bronwyn is referring to are a group calling themselves the original sovereigns who caused another controversy recently. They set up camp near the tent embassy just a few weeks before the 50th anniversary celebrations, where they drew attention after staging protests. Wild clashes have erupted in Canberra with protesters torching the old Parliament House building. There were chaotic scenes as police tried to calm the crowd while fire crews brought the blaze under... Here's Linda June Co again. I became aware of it, actually, on the 21st of December when the, the doors of old Parliament House were set alight by this particular group who who I believe are an anti-vax movement which is comprised of the alt-right white supremacists spreading fear about vaccination unfortunately what happened is um, they've co-opted a few black followers into that movement as well and have put them up as as Aboriginal leaders and unfortunately um, have utilised language of the Aboriginal rights movement And of course, a lot of confusion as well. They were essentially stating that we had sided with colonisers because we wanted what's best for our mob in terms of their health and ensuring that there is um, an awareness around vaccine and the importance of, you know, ensuring that our mob were getting vaccinated. Yeah, that's so frustrating. I mean, in a way, like these groups were sort of dominating and taking advantage of the fact that First Nations people have a pretty understandable distrust of the health system a lot of the time because there is a very dark history and experimentation and mistreatment of First Nations people. So it's very very manipulative that these sort of alt-right groups would try to kind of co-opt these First Nations people and get them to join their cause using this distrust and fear that is so much more real than they could ever imagine. Absolutely. It it, it was really um, worrying at the time because it felt like as well that um, the, the 50th anniversary was just right around the corner and they were doing their best to derail what was a positive message that our mob should come together and celebrate the oldest political protest in the world. Um, was trying to be overrun by by this group and unfortunately black followers who were black cladding. Black cladding is where an organisation will appropriate um, an Aboriginal person or an Aboriginal culture and um, utilise it or exploit it for their own gain. So once these alt-right groups were trying to overrun and essentially try to hijack the Aboriginal tent embassy. What happened? Like, how was that resolved? So the Aboriginal elders uh, of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people whose lands that the tent embassy is based upon um, met, as well as um, tent embassy elders, and put out a statement that the Aboriginal people involved with the anti-vax movement did not represent, have a mandate, or were endorsed by the Aboriginal tent embassy. So they tried to defuse the situation. Um, they actually called for the Canberra police, the ACT police, to intervene um, and had genuine concerns about the safety of of the Aboriginal people who were camping at the site at the time. Oh, my goodness, that's so disrespectful just for mob to be doing that to elders like that. Absolutely, sis. And I think that's what really outlined or demonstrated to, to other people who were unsure about what was happening that... Um, the Aboriginal people who are involved in that movement were actually in breach of our own cultural protocols. We asked Linda's Auntie Jenny at the Ten Embassy what she felt when the original sovereign group showed up. Crazy. They were the ones that actually put Canberra at great risk. And I think the city's actually dodged a very large bullet there by not getting the numbers of COVID cases that I thought would come as a consequence. And they're still here, you know, if you have to look look around, you know. They're still here. I don't know what they think they're achieving or what the goal is, but it seems to be a whole lot of craziness and a whole lot of people, lost people walking around looking for something that looks like freedom. Today, Auntie Jenny is among those Aboriginal people camping at the embassy, keeping the fire going and educating people about the site and its history. She says daily life is pretty quiet and she enjoys that. If you want to make a fire and get up and do it, if you want to just sit at the fire all day and watch the embers, if you want to do work around the camp, um, you know, there's always something to do. Wood is an eternal quest you're always needing and looking for wood because of burning the fire. 
you know, in 72, we had nothing like this. The fancy tents, um, that's my caravan. I bought that down at, on the um, 40th anniversary 10 years ago. The um, comforts are a bit better in these tents, but it's still camping, so you need basics like toilet and water and everything like that. Before the pandemic, Auntie Jenny says school groups would come and go. Now they usually call ahead to book a time. As part of the 50th anniversary commemorations, members of the embassy are working to collate a history of the site. They hope it can be turned into a teaching module for schools. I think um, it's one of the things, there's a glaring lapse of the education system teaching the political history of black Australia, not, not the political history of white Australia once black Australia to pretend it once, but the real political history of our people. For Auntie Jenny, the tent embassy is a symbol of that history a symbol of the resistance against the violence perpetrated against Aboriginal people for 250 years. We've had generations of white Australia believe they had the right to massacre our people en masse. You know, the, the degradations that were committed are just unspeakable, a lot of them. But that's the history that Australia's got to actually acknowledge and come to terms with. Auntie Jenny has little time for Aboriginal MPs, such as Labor's Linda Burney and Ken Wyatt, the Liberal Party's current Minister for Indigenous Australians. They've um, compromised with white Australia. They put their hand up to go into these parliaments. Um, Linda or Ken were not elected by a black constituency and yet the parties use them as their spokespeople for all issues that are related to black people in this country. So really not a very good or a very fair system, you know. They'll come into office and they'll go out of office and they'll be forgotten very quickly. But the problem is that they leave um, a footprint of that compromise um, with white Australia, with the government and with how they propose to move forward in realising justice for black Australia. When I yarned with Bronwyn Carlson, I asked her how younger Indigenous rights activists have built upon the protests at the Tent Embassy in that fight for justice. I think we really have to acknowledge and pay homage to the old people who have kept those fires burning and kept the story going, and I think that's the power of that place. So, you know, I guess in the 60s and 70s there were great hopes. You know, we had the Tent Embassy and we have a lot of political activism. And then sort of the 80s and 90s we thought change would come from that activism. And we've slowly realised that that is not the case when we're looking at the situation where we have such high rates of deaths in custody. The mortality rate between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people hasn't really closed much. We still see our old people dying early with multiple illnesses generally related to um, stress, racism and poverty still happening in 2022. Um, you know, the other day there was a Four Corners report um, which reported on heart disease in the Dumaji community and the high rates of people there who were diagnosed with a heart disease that has not been seen in the rest of the population across the country for a long time. So these are the kinds of um, diseases and illnesses that have been eradicated amongst the mainstream population that still impact Indigenous communities who make up around 3% of the total population. So that means in a country that prides itself on being First Nation and prides itself on being the lucky country and a place where wealth and the enjoyment of life are all part and parcel with it, fair go for all and all this kind of rhetoric that gets spouted, how come then the First Peoples who make up such a small population are still dying in such ways? And so, so we can see that all of that activism didn't result in good faith change from our government, even though there was talk of land rights. We saw promise after promise after promise. And so now what's happening is the grandchildren of those people, just like Linda June and others, are saying, hang on a minute, I've seen my family die young. I've seen my family struggle. I've seen my grandparents fighting for the same thing I'm now fighting for. And so they're joining those kind of dots together, thinking this is not right. So I'd say the tent embassy is going to stand for a lot longer than politicians could ever possibly hope for. It's going to be there as a symbol for the next generation because young people now are telling their children about the history of that place. And those children will look around them and say, hmm, not much has changed. This place needs to stand and maybe it needs to grow.
When I yarned with Linda June Coe, I was in awe of the political education she got as a kid, growing up steeped in activism, protest and fight. Many First Nations people, myself included, didn't have this as children. We came to our activism a bit later, angered by what we see happening to our communities. When Linda June goes to the embassy today, she tells me that she feels a special relationship to the site. When I travel down to the embassy, it's, it's a place for me to actually sit and be still and just remember all of the, all of the staunch worries that have come through there um, and, and have left their footprints around that, that, you know, that site. And it's a place for me to actually ground myself and regather, regather some strength and from that spirit as well in that the journey for justice has to continue. Um, and being able to just sit there and immerse myself amongst, you know, the trees, amongst the clouds and um, hearing the crow, hearing the magpie, the possum that comes out at night time, you know, he's seen many, many different faces come through there and he overheard many yarns. It's just a place where I can reconnect with that strength of, of spirit, of, you know, the fight of our mob or the plight for our people. That's, yeah, that's amazing. In your words, like why do you think the tent embassy is still open? Because we refuse to go away. The families involved there refuse to go away. We refuse to die out. We refuse to be terra nullius. Luckily for our mob, we've been able to negotiate terms of uh, coexistence down there in Canberra with the ACT uh, government. And I think um, over the years, the Ten Embassy has um, has grown legs and walked out of Canberra. We saw that at the 40th anniversary 10 years ago. We saw the establishment of the Brisbane Aboriginal Ten Embassy, which has still got its place there in Musgrave Park, where the local blackfellas there in Brisbane gather for community business for the 26th of January. Um, in Perth as well, there was an Aboriginal Ten Embassy, Melbourne, Cowra, where I'm from. So the Ten Embassy has really, really expanded, not only in the consciousness, but physically as well. And that was the agenda 10 years, to, years ago to assert or reaffirm sovereignty right across this country through our presence alone. We've been here since time immemorial and since the first sunrise and the first sunset. And as long as there's blackfellas on this country, the Ten Embassy will stand. Do you think that the embassy will always be there, though, or do you reckon it'll only stay as long as we feel it's needed? I believe as long as my bloodline connections are on this planet, the Aboriginal 10 embassy will stand. Carissa, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Uh, I got to ask, have you been to the tent embassy? No, I haven't. I've only seen it from the outside when I was visiting Canberra, but I'd really love to actually go in and meet everyone and see how it all works and, yeah, just get a better look at it. Uh, speaking of the tent embassy, I worked on a story with Bronwyn Carlson and Linda June Coe about the history of the Aboriginal tent embassy and why it's so significant for First Nations people and Australia. And we've also covered the original sovereign protests and the issues they raise in depth too. We'll put some links to those stories in the show notes. All right. Well, thank you for the podcast and for those stories, Carissa. Thanks for coming on, Carissa. Thanks. Okay. For our next story, we're going to hear about how the pandemic has changed the landscape of economic opportunity, in particular for people in their 20s. Young Lives, a study run by the University of Oxford in the UK, has been following the lives of young people in India, Peru, Vietnam and Ethiopia since the early 2000s. Of course, in 2020, the pandemic hit, and a lot of the young people in this survey saw their job opportunities evaporate. The researchers kept in touch with the young people by phone, and in their latest survey, they found that the recovery has not been equal for everyone when it comes to finding work. I'm uh, Kath Porter. I'm the director of the Young Lives Study based at Oxford University, and I'm a senior lecturer at Lancaster University as well. And what is the Young Lives Study? So yeah, Young Lives, it's a really unique study. It's been going now for just over 20 years since the turn of the millennium. And what we've been doing is following the lives of children born into poverty 20 plus years ago, and we've been following their lives as they grow up. 
We're in four countries, Ethiopia, India in the states of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, Peru and Vietnam. And we've been documenting the lives of these 12,000 children over the years. 12,000, that's yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. A lot of people. <laughs> yeah. So there are 12,000, I guess they're not kids anymore, but 12,000 young people in, in four countries. Who are they? How were they recruited? And how old are they now? The study design is, it's a cohort study. So we follow two sets of children. Uh, each cohort was born within a year of, of each other. So we've got two cohorts born seven years apart. So our main cohort, you could call them the children of the millennium, for example. It's 2,000 boys and girls born in each country, and they were born just after the start of the millennium. So they're just coming into their early 20s right now. And then in each country, we have another cohort, which we call the older cohort, and there's around a thousand of them in each country. And they're now into their sort of mid to late 20s age, sort of 26 uh, years old. So we chose the communities in the beginning to be relatively representative of poorer communities in each country and with a representative sort of mix of geographies, um, urban, rural, etc., but with a focus on poor communities. And then within each community, um, the teams look for households with uh, children of the right age group. Mm. And so I guess when they were children, you were contacting their parents and then as they got older, you talked to the children and themselves. But how often do you get in touch with them and how do you do that? Yes, in the beginning, we, of course, interacted more with the parent or the caregiver. It's a big operation. It takes almost a year to do the surveys. So we, we first went when the, the younger cohort were aged sort of around one year, six to 18 months. And then we revisited every three to four years. When did you last contact them? The last time we called was a phone call in November and December of last year. So what did you find in that last call? What were the kind of key things you, you've discovered? Yeah, so in, in the last round, what we've found is um, there's been a continuation of the pandemic, um, as we know, and Vietnam has now really been more affected than it had in previous waves. Overall, we found, I think, a lot of uh, widening inequalities, both between and within countries. So, for example, access to vaccines is very, very low in Ethiopia, but much better in Vietnam. Within countries, we find gaps between rich and poor people. Education, we found inequality um, has been around access to the internet. Without the internet, it's really difficult to continue your studies if the schools are closed. And I know you, every time you do these surveys, you have a huge amount of data um, because you're not actually collecting quotes you're collecting data points on on people but what we want to focus on here is is some of the findings you've got about employment and jobs because I think they tell an interesting picture about the way people uh, and young people are getting back into the labor market so let's focus in on on two countries in particular India and Peru and can we start with India can you tell us what's happening in the job market the employment situation there for young Indians right now yeah I think it's a really important um thing to focus on because for young people, it's been less about the health effects of the crisis and it's been much more about uh, the economic effects of the lockdowns and the drop in economic activity. So India had a very strict lockdown at the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020. That lasted for 75 days and also the schools were closed for most of that calendar year. In 2021, they relaxed things a little bit and there were local lockdowns in place. Um, and as we know, there was quite a heavy wave of COVID in 2021, which was the Delta variant. So it really affected employment a lot for young people. So just before the pandemic, around 65% of our older cohort, so that's the ones aged around 26 years old, and around a third of the younger cohort were working. Uh, that's the 20 to 21 year olds. Now that dropped down very, very significantly during the lockdown. You have to remember that most of the young people that we've been talking to don't have a formal contract and they don't have access to any kind of sort of furlough or other payments if they were not working. So we saw quite a sharp drop in employment activity. But then we've seen a, a process of recovery towards the end of 2020. And then that slowly continued, even during the wave of 
COVID that we saw in 2021, mainly because there wasn't a shutdown at that point. So when you look at the overall employment levels, actually things are almost recovered compared to pre-pandemic. But one of the issues that we've started to uncover is that I think a lot of young workers have been able to keep their job, but at the cost of accepting a worst paid job and maybe worse working conditions, including just saying that they've been working, but they've been working for themselves, trying to sell something on the street or something like that. Mm. And have you found any differences between what the job situation is for for men and, and women in India? Yeah, before the pandemic, there was a very large gender gap in India. Whilst 85% of young men were working, only 45% of young women were working. Again, I'm talking about the older group here. And we find, yeah, young women are, you know, in school, they keep moving along um, at a similar pace, but then they just don't go into the labor market as much. So a, a huge gap already pre-pandemic. And then um, when the lockdown happened, there was a big drop, especially for the young men. So it went down to half of the young men were then working. The drop was actually slightly less for the young women, sort of from 45 to 35%. So actually at the height of the lockdown, the gap was a little bit narrower. But then what's happened in the recovery is that more men have gone back to work and fewer women have gone back to work. And actually what's quite interesting for the younger cohort, so that's the sort of 20-year-old cohort, um, fewer of them were working in the first place. But just when the lockdown was eased, a lot of the young men were actually pushed into work. And we think that's for economic reasons and also because higher education courses were either closed or they'd gone online and it was difficult to access them. So it's been a sort of push into work for for some of our young men who might have wanted to continue their schooling. I guess it's important to understand there that the gender gap was significant before the pandemic, but it's just at this point where we are in at the beginning of 2022, it's, it's just widened even more. It's widened a lot. So uh, around 90% of um, young men are in work. So nine in 10 of the men and four in 10 of the women. So it's, yeah, it's a pretty large gap. Yeah. And do you know why this might be happening? Yeah, I think it's a real return to traditional gender roles in a way. We definitely saw that a larger proportion of women uh, said that their caring responsibilities had increased during the pandemic. Um, Around four in 10 said that they spent time caring for others uh, in their household, whereas it was less than one in 10 of young men said they had any kind of caring responsibilities. So we think that's taken up a lot of young women's time and their responsibilities. And equally, that when there's been an economic crisis, young men are seen as having to go to work to support their households and bring in some money. So that's what's happening in India. But the beauty of your study is that you can compare it with other countries. And you've seen something similar happening in Peru as well. Yes, yes, it is an interesting comparison. I mean, COVID-wise, Peru has been really badly hit by the pandemic. In Peru, they also had a very, very strict lockdown at the beginning of the of the pandemic, which caused a sharp fall in the number of young people who were employed, and then a somewhat bumpy recovery, um, especially for the young men. But again, with this issue of job quality going down and earnings going down as the sort of cost of keeping yourself in a job, but it's perhaps not quite as good a job as, as you had before. Okay. And you were also seeing a gender employment gap as well. Yeah, I think we can more clearly say it's about childcare in Peru, because at this point, we still have the schools closed. So any woman who has a school age child um, is going to have to find a way to look after them. And as in India, we do see a a bit of a return to traditional roles and that women are, are seen to be the ones who should look after the children. So I think that is why young women are not going back to work as much in Peru. Mm. So standing back from this, what does this mean for young people in Peru and India um, and their futures? Yeah, I mean, 
becoming an adult, <laughs> finding your, you know, your first few jobs in the world, get finish trying to finish your education, trying to build your own family. I mean, that's a that's a difficult part of life, I think, at the best of times. But I mean, imagine trying to do it in a pandemic. And what we've also found is a worrying level of uh, mental health issues during the pandemic, and it's been quite sustained. In Peru, for example, it's 44% of our older cohort women, so the the 26-year-olds, 44% of them are experiencing symptoms of anxiety. That is a big worry. In Peru, it's definitely a big issue for young men and women, but particularly for young women. Uh, In India, it is not quite as pronounced. And in Vietnam, we were seeing, just to bring in Vietnam, because in a, in a way, Vietnam was much less affected until very recently, but we've seen a doubling of mental health issues in Vietnam in our latest survey. And, you know, we know that when, when people have um, mental health issues like anxiety or depression, it makes it much harder to find and hold on to jobs. And we know that there are lower levels of social support. So young people are going to struggle if they're not able to build their livelihoods at this point, which is the foundation for the rest of their adult lives. So I think we really have to think about um, how we can support young people now economically um, and help them to get good quality jobs if we want them to get their lives back on track, basically. Obviously, when you began this study, these were children who were born into poverty. 20 years later, what, how are they faring and how has the pandemic affected their life trajectory? Yeah, up until 2020, we were, you know, it was quite a good news story, actually. A lot of people were doing much better than their parents were, for sure. Better access to services like clean water, electricity, that kind of thing. And even when you compared our two cohorts, who were just seven years apart, we found that the younger cohort, at every time we interviewed them, were doing better. They were healthier, they were taller, they were in a better grade at school, that kind of thing. And then, unfortunately, when the pandemic hit, we actually found an almost a reversal in terms of their well-being compared to the other cohort. We did have a lot of inequality. We did find that those who had a slightly better start in life um, were doing better, even though most of them were poorer to begin with. Um, and what we find is that the pandemic's really widening inequalities. Economic inequalities intersected with social inequalities gender, as we've discussed a lot, but also ethnic inequalities, uh, caste inequalities in India. Um, And these groups tend to have already been somewhat disadvantaged and these disadvantages have widened. Mm. Thank you so much for coming and and telling us all about your, your latest round of surveys. Thank you for having me. That was Kath Porter at the University of Oxford. We'll put a link to the Young Lives study in our show notes. So if you're a regular listener to The Conversation Weekly, you'll know this is where we usually turn to an editor from around the world to tell us what they've been working on. We're hitting the pause button on that segment for now, but you can of course hear the latest news and analysis from academic experts around the world on theconversation.com. That's it for this week. Thanks to all the academics who've spoken to us for this episode. Thanks of course to Carissa Lee and to The Conversation's executive editor, Stephen Kahn. And thank you to Alice Mason for our social media promotion. You can find us on Twitter at TC underscore audio, Instagram at theconversation.com, or email us, podcast at theconversation.com. Sign up for our free daily email. Just click the link in the show notes. If you're enjoying The Conversation Weekly, please leave a rating or review wherever podcast apps allow you to do so. The Conversation Weekly is co-produced by Mend Marawani and me, Gemma Ware, with sound design by Eloise Stevens. Reporting and sound at the Tent Embassy in Canberra was by Ellen Duffy. Our theme music is by Nita Sal. I'm Dan Reno. Thanks for listening.